So one of the things that has become very clear to me, um, and uh, I've been saying this and thinking it for some time, uh, but I think in the next decade it's going to become more and more obvious, uh, is that um, the distinction between who we are as followers of Jesus and those who are not is going to become more and more obvious and evident. Okay? And so I say that because one of the things I think it's very important as that time approaches and is already here in some ways, that I think it's very important for us to know what we believe and why. And uh, so we're, we're going to have to understand in the conversations that we have and, and, and things that take place, this is what I believe, and this is who I am, and this is who God has called me to be. And we not, not be ashamed of that. So we're going to do a series here the next few weeks about salvation. Basically, what does it mean to be saved? What does that look like? How does that happen? What is the process? And, uh, and those sorts of things. So we're going to start today with the most difficult question of the whole thing. And the question is, are we elected or is there free will? Okay? So that's a, that's a big discussion that's been happening for 500 years. Uh, we're not going to solve it today. Well, maybe we are going to solve it today. We're going to try and solve it today. We're going to take 500 years of debate and we're going to fix it today. Okay? <laughs> So, we're just going to take care of it, we're going to leave, we're going to know all the answers, all right? So, all of this goes back to the munchkins, all right, of the donut holes. So, we as a staff, this week, we sat down and we picked 10 people that we believed, if we offered them a munchkin, five that we believed would take it, and five that we believed would not, all right? So we offered them donut holes, and we were almost spot on. We missed it by one person, right? So the question that, that comes to mind is, did we choose them, or did they make a choice? Because they wouldn't have had a munchkin had we not presented it to them, right? So Clint just walked out, and I was going to embarrass Clint a little bit. Um, he was one of our choices, and he took several, and we knew that he would. <laughs> Right? So, did we choose Clint because we knew that what he would do, or did Clint make that choice on his own? And that's kind of the theological discussion that goes on with this idea when we're saved is did God choose me or did I choose him? Now, that may sound like it's not a big deal, but I'm telling you right now in theological circles, it's a huge deal and it's becoming a bigger and bigger deal. And so what we see historically is there's a pendulum that swings back and forth from free will to election, back and forth. And right now we're swinging towards election in a very strong and very powerful, almost ruthless way uh, towards election. So I, I'm going to tell you up front before I talk about this that I lean very heavily towards the free will side. All right? I was raised that way. The seminary I went to taught that. Uh, and so I'm well versed in that. So even as I go through the verses that teach the other side, I'm dissecting the verses and saying, this is why it's not right. Okay? So, but today I'm going to do my very best to be objective. All right? And I'm going I'm to try as hard as I can. So, so please don't hear what I'm saying as an attack on either side, because I really do think the conclusion we have is the absolute best conclusion. Okay? So what is it? Did God choose me? Or did I choose him? We're going to look at two passages of Scripture. The first one is in Ephesians chapter 1. All right, so we're on page 1173, if you're using the Pew Bible. 1173, Ephesians chapter 1. We'll start with verse 3, and this is Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And we'll see as we go through, this is what makes this subject a little more confusing is because Paul seems to defend both sides. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Paul wrote this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. 
In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Wow, it just seems very obvious that God chose us, okay? And so I think, I think to be honest with Scripture, we have to say that's what it says. So let's stop and think about this for just a minute. Isn't it cool to be chosen? Let me think about it. I want every couple that's sitting together right now, I want you to look at your spouse, and I want you to say, thank you for choosing me. Because of all the four billion people that you could have chosen, you chose me. Right? That's a big deal. To be chosen is awesome. I remember when I was a kid, and there was a big empty lot across the street from our house, and the kids in the neighborhood came together in this big empty lot, and we played baseball. Occasionally, I got them to play God's game football, but, but normally it was baseball. And so, but here's, here's what would happen, is two guys would be selected to be captains, right? I'm sure most of you did this. And, and the captains would pick teams. And out loud, they say, I want this guy, I want this guy, I want this guy, I want this guy. When I first started playing, I was eight or nine, and I was one of the youngest, and I was always one of the last ones picked. I hated being the last one picked. I wanted to play so well that I was the first one picked. But I was so young, I, I, they just, I never was, until a few years later, I got a little bigger, got a little better, and all of a sudden, I was one of the first five picked. And then a little later, I was one of the first ones picked, and I was so proud of the fact that I was chosen right? Because being chosen is awesome. Think about this reality. The God of the universe who spoke the words and created everything out of nothing looked at you before the beginning of time and chose you. Wow! That is a big deal. That is awesome. That this reality is, is that the most powerful force that has ever existed looked and decided that I was worthy to be his kid. Whew. What an amazing privilege and honor that is. Now, I don't want to, to downplay it at all, and, and I want to say very honestly up front that this belief system in and of itself has some advantages, one being that when I talk about the kid in India who's born a Hindu and never hears about Jesus, if they're elected, then they got it. I don't have to worry about that or feel guilty about it. But the flip side is for me that if this is the only reality there is, the same God that picked me for eternity had to essentially pick people to not have eternity. Whew, that one's hard for me. So, but the truth is, the scripture makes it clear that at some level, God chose us. That is so awesome. That is so incredible. And we need to be glad that he did because it's a great privilege and an opportunity. Now, let's look at another verse, Romans 8. Again by Paul. Romans 8. 8 through 13, this time to the church at Rome, different setting, different group of people, different message, it seems. Page 1135 in the Pew Bible. Romans 10, 8. Did I mess up? It's 10, 8, I'm sorry. Romans 10, 8. My bad, 11.35. It was predetermined that I would say that wrong. <laughs> Romans 10, 8. I'm sorry, my bias came out. All right, 10, 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All right? So there is this other side at some level, at some way, it seems that we choose. 
So we have this reality that God chooses us and this reality that somehow, some way, I choose or don't choose God. Now, now if it's true that I choose, um, I have the potential to make a really bad decision, right? I have the potential to do something that is eternally a bad decision. And I have the potential to get it wrong in a very big way. All right, so life is full, and in our world we know right now, life is full of people who make bad decisions, right? We can see that on the news every single day. There are a lot of people who make, there are companies that make bad decisions. I, I was recounting this story recently. Um, when I was a teenager and on through the first part of married life, uh, and even after we moved here, um, Blockbuster Video was a big deal. Remember that? You remember going on Friday night or Friday afternoon, and you go into the Blockbuster, and you look through hundreds of movies, and you try to pick one that you want to watch, right? Or the one you want to watch somebody else already had, and you ask if they have it behind the counter. And it started off, some of you don't, probably don't remember this, it started off as Beta and VHS, right? And Beta went away, and it was only VHS. Then DVDs came, and it was VHS and DVDs, then VHS went away, right? Well, Blockbuster owned the movie market. I mean, like 85% of the market was Blockbuster. They were in charge. Well, there was a little company that came about called Netflix. And Netflix decided to try something different. What they said was, we're going to send people movies and let them send them back for free. All right, so they started doing that. And eventually, Netflix began to figure out, not only can we do that, we can let people download movies, not all movies, but a few, and they can watch it on their computer. And they started to grow, and, and things started to develop. And so the guys at Netflix realized, we, we're onto something here. So they went to Blockbuster. I don't know if anybody knows this, but they went to Blockbuster and sat down with the leaders at Blockbuster. I said, listen, we're onto something big here. We would like to sell you our business for $50 million. Now, I would like to have been a fly in the wall after they left, as the board was sitting around the table deciding if that was a good idea. Because I guarantee you the board looks back now and thinks, oh, that was the worst decision we ever made. Because they were talking around the room, you know, these guys may be onto something, but we own 85% of the market. Why would we mess with this little group? Why would we pay $50 million for this? And Blockbuster said, no. About that time, Netflix took off. And today, Netflix is worth $20 billion, and Blockbuster's gone. Somebody made a bad decision, right? So let me tell you, if it's true that we have a say in this decision concerning God, it's a big one. It's a very, very important decision. In fact, it's an eternal decision. And it's one we need to take very seriously. It's one that we need to focus on. It's one that we need to get right. Okay? So, there are some disadvantages and advantages to this belief system. Uh, I believe it affirms the reality that God wants everybody to be saved. It creates the problem of that little kid in India that grew up not hearing about Jesus and grew up Hindu. And really, it's not really their fault. It's mine. They didn't hear about him. Hmm. So all of a sudden, I'm stuck with these two realities that honestly can both be defended biblically. And I'm like, what's going on here? Why don't we know the answer to this? Why doesn't this make sense? It should make sense, but it doesn't. So I've got a little illustration here. And hopefully, it's an illustration that will help you. Uh, I know it's helped me. It's a, it's a spinoff from uh, somebody else that came up with this idea, and uh, hopefully it's a little more understandable than how he did it. Um, but this is a representation of God's sport. Sorry, Lita. All right? And so, just for you Jaguar fans, I love my quarterback, the Cowboys. Just letting you know. All right, so... <laughs> So anyway, this is a football. Okay, so I want you to pretend with me for a minute that this football represents the process of salvation. Okay? 
And I want you to, to, to think about this reality that God sees this football completely and clearly. He knows every detail of it. He understands how it works. He understands what it looks like. He understands the process. And we're talking about an eternal process here that really only God understands. But he sees the whole picture. He knows exactly what this looks like. You and I, on the other hand, we have some biblical verses and some pictures. And so God decided in the scripture, I'm going to give you a little peek of what this is like. And so... This is a football. Now, if that was the only picture of a football, what would you think a football looked like? A baseball. A baseball, right? And you'd be confused about God's glory, right? Okay? <laughs> so so here, here's, here's the reality. You, if you were told this was a football and that's all you ever saw as a football, you would have an incomplete picture. Yes? What if instead God said... That's a football. It's a closer picture, but is it a complete picture? See, this is why Paul said, right now I see through a glass darkly. I don't understand all of this. I'm writing to you what I believe, and I'm writing to you what I understand, but, but I don't see the whole picture. You see, you and I know that a football looks like this. But what if God said, I just want you to see this part of it? This is all you need to know. What I put in the scripture and what I put there, even if it doesn't make sense to you, it, it doesn't matter that it doesn't make sense to you. But we say, but God, we need to understand this. We need to get this right. And God says, no, I need to get this right. This isn't yours to get right. It is mine. But, but God, there's, there's so many questions that we have and so many things that are not clear about this. I've given you what you need to know in the Scripture. And, and so I, I look at this reality and I look at what God has done and I look at what He has shown us and I come to this conclusion, if I'm honest with Scripture, I have to come to this conclusion that the answer is both. that somehow God chooses me and he gives me a chance to choose him. And I gotta tell you, in my little brain, that makes zero sense. It makes absolutely no sense. See, and, and, and just as a side, I think it's very, very important for you to understand that right now this debate is hot and heavy, and it's not getting any less hot and heavy. It's getting worse. And there are Christians out there who are saying, if you don't believe one way or the other, you're completely wrong. And you don't really know God, even, some of them. But if we're honest with Scripture, we have to say that it's both ways. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You're right, it doesn't. But it also doesn't make sense that there are billions of people on the planet right now praying and God hears them all. I don't get that. Right? Do you get that? And part of the reality of following God and what makes Him God is that He's not understandable. And so when He chooses to make it both and, then I have to say, okay, I trust you to be God. And I wonder, I wonder if God would say to us, you're asking a question I never meant for you to ask. You're asking a question I never meant for you to ask. This didn't become a big deal until about 500 years ago. The church was around a long time before that. Maybe you're focused on the wrong stuff. Maybe what you need to focus on are the people around you in your life that are hungry and hurting. Maybe you need to focus on loving those who need to be loved. Maybe you need to focus on telling other people about faith and what it means to follow Jesus. 
Maybe you need to focus on the stuff that I have made clear to you in Scripture. Because really, that's what I want you to do. Paul warned us at one point about having worthless discussions and worthless debates and how it would distract us. And I think sometimes we find ourselves there. So, all of that to say, God's got it. And he's going to get it right. Our job is the Great Commission to let people know the truth that Jesus came and died for us. And the rest is up to him. Let's pray.